Pulse audio is by no means perfect, but one of the cool things you can use if you do run it is called Pulse Effects, which basically lets you do digital effects to your input and your output sound. Now, in this video, I'm going to be looking at the input stuff just because it's a bit easier to show you that in a video. But if you do want to modify any of your output sound, that's going to be done in this tab right here. So if I open up something like, say, MPV... As we're going to see now we have MPV in here. So if we go over to this tab right here, this is going to be for my input. Now, the reason why I'm looking at pulse effects is because most of the effects I do to my microphone are done inside of OBS. But one of the things missing in OBS is EQ. Now, on Windows, there is an EQ plugin for OBS. It's not compiled for Linux though, and it's a closed source application, so I can't go and compile it myself. For the rest of the video, I'm going to have my OBS filters disabled, so if you notice that my microphone sounds a bit different from the way that it normally does, that's going to be why. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we've actually got pulse effects enabled on the device we want to enable it on. So in this case, I'm going to be running it on my microphone input, not on my desktop audio. So you probably noticed that nothing's actually changed right now, but it is actually showing that it is running inside of pulse effects. Now, this is going to be true for any microphone, but I know that the Blue Yeti in particular has a noise floor that picks up a lot of background noise. So some of the background noise is going to be coming from my computer. So if I'm just silent for just a moment, as you can notice, it is still picking up a bit of sound. So some of that is from the computer itself, but some of it is just from the microphone running. Now... Different microphones pick up a different amount of noise from the microphone actually being powered, but the Blue Yeti is actually kind of noticeable. So the way that you go and combat that is by enabling a noise gate. So a noise gate, basically the short version is if the noise is below a certain level, the microphone effectively turns off and stops picking up noise. Now the best way to determine where your noise gate should be is to look at these numbers on the left hand side here and be dead silent. So as we can see, they're anywhere from negative 58 to negative 54 or so. So what we want to do is set our noise gate threshold slightly above that point because we don't want to go and cut into where we're actually speaking, but we want to cut out as much of that background noise as possible. So in my case, I'm going to set it to, let's go with negative 45. I know that's a bit high, but it's still going to be perfectly safe in this case. So if I'm just quiet for a moment... As we can see, as soon as I stop talking, we have less background noise. And also the gate is being enabled as we'd expect. Now, there's a couple other things we can go and modify in here as well. So the input level is basically the amount to raise up the input volume before doing any filtering. You probably don't want to do this, though, because it's just going to make your life harder than it needs to be. So let's raise this up by, say, uh, three so I don't blow out your eardrums. And as you notice, it is going to be a bit louder now. So I'm going to put it back down to where it was. And the attack level is, once the gate actually closes, how long to actually take to open it back up. So if the attack is going to be lower, when you start speaking again, it's going to open up the gate quicker. If it's higher, it takes longer. Release is basically the opposite. So that is how quickly to close the gate as soon as you stop making noise. The ratio basically describes the level of compression to use, so in this case it's set to 2 to 1 compression. The knee is how hard the compression actually is, so I would recommend looking at like a diagram of how compression actually works, because it's kind of difficult to explain in words, and then makeup is how much you actually boost the output volume by. And then the maximum gain reduction is effectively how quiet do you want the gated noise to actually be. So in this case, it's going to be a maximum of minus 25 decibels. So that looks a bit like that, but if we set it to say something like negative 5 instead, as we can see, the effect is far less. There's more than just one sort of gate available inside of Pulse Effects. So we have the regular gate we've been using here, which is fine for most of the time, but we also have a multiband gate as well. Now, I'm not going to enable this because out of the box, it's configured absolutely terribly for voice, and you won't be able to hear a word I say, but what it lets you do is actually do gating based on the frequency pattern. So you can say, I don't want to hear much of the high frequency because maybe you have, I don't know, a fridge outside that has a weird hum, or you don't want to hear much of the low frequency for basically the same reason. 
pretty much it lets you modify how much of each band you actually hear. Be careful though because it might start to eat into your voice if you don't have it configured correctly. The next thing I want to mention is the compressor. So a compressor is basically going to, I guess, compress down the range of volume levels available in your audio stream. So if I'm talking where I'm at right now, and then I was to move, say, way back here, you probably notice that the, uh, the volume level gets considerably quieter. If I move, say, in front of the microphone, it now gets quieter again. So a compressor basically stops as much of that range actually happening. So as you move closer and further away from the mic, it basically has less of an effect. I've gone and mirrored the compressor settings I'm using inside of OBS, inside of Pulse Effects. I'm not saying these are perfect settings for the Blue Yeti. This is just what I currently am using. So if I just go and move forward while I'm talking like this, you can probably notice that the volume level is changing a lot. So if I go and enable the compressor now, as you can probably notice, as I do this, the amount of change isn't actually as great as it was before. So basically, it, it makes it so if you are the sort of person who likes to move around a lot, there isn't as much of a noticeable change. And like with the gate, there's also a multiband compressor as well. So this works in basically the same way. Once again, it's configured really terribly out of the box and you probably don't need to use it in most situations. For voice, using just the regular compressor and regular gate is gonna be fine. But if you do need to actually modify the compression settings based on the frequency spectrum, then this is available for you to use as well. Now WebRTC itself isn't actually a filter. What it is, is a collection of other filters. So if we go and enable this, what it's going to do is have an echo canceller, so this actually might be useful in my room. I'm not sure how much this has actually modified my audio sound, so I'm sorry if it's really bad right now. But we also have a noise suppressor. Now a noise suppressor is very similar to a noise gate, but is... I guess less extreme. Technically a noise gate doesn't actually disable the microphone, what it does is just applies an extreme level of compression. We also have this gain controller here which basically lets you modify the amount of gain applied to the input, a compressor once again, and then a voice detector. Now the voice detector, I'm not really sure what it's supposed to be doing, but it does something with detecting your voice. Now if you are going to be using the WebRTC, make sure that you don't also go and enable the gate and the compressor as well, or the multiband gate and multiband compressor, because what's going to happen is you're going to apply two levels of gating and two levels of compression, and if you go and change the settings in one place, you're going to notice that it's not really going to have the effect that you expected it to, because you're also compressing it or gating it in another place anyway. Equalizer is something that most people have probably messed with to some extent, but basically what it lets you do is modify how much volume or how much gain is applied to each of the frequencies available here. So let's say that we wanted to do something like boost up the lows by a bit. So let's boost up this, 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 and this. You can probably notice that my mic here is starting to sound a bit different. I apologize if it sounds terrible now. So what we can do instead is let's actually go and reset this. So if we hit this button down here, and then click this one right here. And as we can see, there's actually a couple of presets in here. So we can go and apply, say, the uh, the more base preset and looks a little something like this. As you could probably tell, not all of the presets are intended to be used with voice. So just keep that in mind. And if you want to use the EQ properly, I would recommend just fiddling around with it for a while, listening to the result, and just tweaking it to the point where you actually like it. So you probably also noticed that when we actually enabled that preset, it modified the number of bands that we have. So by default, it's set to 30 bands, but we can go and set this to say, let's make it a three band EQ. And now we just have these three bands in here. And now that we have these three bands, we can actually go and modify what frequency they're going to be affecting. The next one is a DSer. Now, DSer is a fairly self-explanatory one. What it does is basically tries to remove the S and the F sounds from your audio. So if I say something like this, you can probably see that it's detecting the S's in here. Now, the amount that you want to reduce these by is really going to depend on the person who's speaking because if they really emphasize their S's it might start to sound really really weird if you cut out too much of it. There are two more effects I want to mention and not every effect has to be an effect that makes it sound better. We can also do things like say reverb and if we enable that as you can probably tell now I'm in this really large room and we can go and actually change this to different room sizes. So let's say we change this to like a uh, tunnel and now I sound like I'm inside of a tunnel. But you can also modify how it actually sounds inside of that room by going and modifying the bass cut and the treble. So if we were to set the bass cut to say, let's go a thousand hertz and set it back to the tunnel now. 
You can probably tell that the low end is sounding a bit different now, but the high end still sounds roughly the same. So let's go and change the treble cut. Let's cut this down to say 500, and now it sounds completely different. Now reverb is fairly self-explanatory, but another one that's fairly self-explanatory is the pitch. So if we go and enable this, as you can notice, my voice is going to sound a little bit different. But if I go and say, raise up the number of octaves, now you're barely going to be able to understand what I'm saying, raise it up and... zero again and then raise up the number of semitones so if you don't know anything about audio there are 12 semitones in an octave so if i raise this up by six it's going to be half as much as raising it up by one octave and you can also play around with these settings up here as well so we make the audio faster now it sounds a little bit like this if we get rid of preserve format it sounds a little bit like this and if we get rid of both of them now it sounds like this Obviously, you wouldn't want to use this for a regular video, but maybe it would be fun in a stream from time to time. So let's go and just enable that. And one thing I do want to mention about these effects is there's a reason I've got my effects in this order here. So out of the box, Pulse Effects seems to have the effects in a completely random order, but they do actually matter like how layers matter in an image editor. So this isn't set in stone or anything, but the general advice I see is go Gates, Suppressor, Compressor, EQ, delay, and then reverb if you want to do those at the end. And then anything specialty like, say, pitch is really going to depend on what the plugin actually is. In the case of pitch, you want that to be at the start so you can actually go and modify a clean audio stream. Now, it seems like between the planning and the recording of this video, some of the features I was going to show you were actually removed in an update because back when I planned this, there was also a delay feature on the microphone as well, which would basically modify the time it took for the sound to hit your left and right ear on your microphone. I thought it was a really cool feature, and if you combine that with reverb, you could get some really interesting effects. Now, I did notice one weird issue with Pulse effects. If it does happen to crash, it might take your microphone with it. So in that case, you're probably going to have to go and restart OBS and then start it back up again, and your microphone should be working then. But... If you don't, you're just basically going to lose your microphone input. Now, I'm no audio expert. I understand this functionality enough to actually make these videos. So my suggestion is anything that sounds interesting in this video, go and look up videos on that specific functionality because I guarantee there are going to be entire series on how to do things like compression and how to do noise gating and things like that, which I really don't have the expertise to explain. So I think that's pretty much everything that I want to talk about for this. I really recommend checking out Pulse Effects for yourself. I would recommend if you do have the money though that you go and do this stuff with hardware because doing it on the hardware side is always going to be better. But if you don't have the room for that or the thousands of dollars to actually buy the equipment for that, Pulse Effects is a reasonable replacement. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald Corbinian, Andre, Nathan, Montezar, Will, Chico Bento, Joseph Mitchell, Peter D. Road, Tony Tushar, and all of my $2 supporters. So if you want to go support my work, them links down below to my Patreon, LibrePay, Subscribestar, that one. Uh... And all of that sort of stuff down below. I've got my podcast, Tech Over T, available basically anywhere. And then this channel is available on Library, Odyssey, and BitChute if you want to watch it on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.